conducting more political education than, than we have for many, many years. And we're also seeing each other very often across generations, across uh, deployments and yeah. so forth. And um, from the SSCP side, so this is part of the uh, Jack Simons Political Education School. Um, from the SSCP side, what we're doing is also building up to our centenary celebration, uh, which will be in July next year. And um, one of the ways we're doing that is obviously to remember outstanding uh, party members. And as it happens this month, it is comrade uh, Rika Hodgson's centenary, centenary of her birth, her, her, her centenary. So it's a wonderful opportunity. And we've, we've deliberately selected the theme of celebrating diversity, uh, give a red card to racism, um, uh, which I think is extremely appropriate to, to the time and legacy uh, of comrade Rika and Jack and many other uh, comrades. So the order of the day would be um, Comrade uh, uh, Spencer, son to Rika and Jack Hodgson, uh, will say a few words from the side of the family. Uh, I believe there's a wonderful uh, video which we'll project into the meeting. And then Comrade Jesse from the ANC, but in her own right as well, of course, uh, will speak. And then we'll conclude with Comrade Solly, also making an input, and then we'll open up to discussion, debate, discussion, and so forth. So um, comrade, uh, welcome to all the comrades present. Uh, we've now got nearly 30 participants uh, on the Zoom meeting and others on, on Facebook. So welcome comrades. Um, and over to you, Spencer. <clears throat> comrades and friends, <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I suddenly have that uh, thing in my throat. <clears throat> Rika would have been incredibly honored uh, that this discussion is being held in her honor. She would have said and truly believed that there were many other comrades who were more deserving of such an honor. She considered herself a foot soldier for freedom, which was the title she gave in her book published in 2010. In marking South Africa's National Women's Day, I'm certain that Rika would have endorsed the statement that to end violence against women, we must tackle patriarchy and poverty. In 1954, Rika attended the inaugural meeting of the National Federation of Women, where she met legendary women like Dora Tomani and Lillian Ngoi. The July edition of Umsa Benzi carried an excellent article by comrade Jenny Schreiner commemorating Rika's life. Therefore, there's no need for me to dwell much on her life in any great detail, however, I would like to sketch just a few highlights before showing you a short video clip of Rika and Jack's arrival and welcome in Dar es Salaam airport in 1963 by the early ANC exile community. It is a clip that illustrates most vividly the great bonds of comradeship of Rika's generation in the struggle to end racism and oppression. Rika committed to the struggle from an early age. In 1945, she married my father, Jack. She joined the Communist Party in 1946, and both she and Jack were founding members of the Congress of Democrats in 1953. They were both banned. During the state of emergency following on the Sharpeville massacre, Rika was detained and imprisoned at the women's jail, Johannesburg, and later at Nastrom prison. She shared a cell with Hilda Bernstein, Violet Weinberg, Helen Joseph, Winnie Kramer, and others. During 1961, our fourth floor flat in Berea became a laboratory and then a workshop for the production of the explosives that would be used by MK on December 16th to launch the sabotage campaign. In 1962, Rika and Jack were placed under house arrest 
until April 63, when they received instructions from MK to escape to Bechuanaland, where they were to set up a transit camp for the passage of MK cadres to and from military training abroad. I remember well the night they left and were driven to the border by the late comrade Andrew Mlangeni. Their stay in Bechuanaland was short and dangerous. Although the country was still a British protectorate, the South African security services were intensifying their onslaught against the movement and they treated Bechuanaland like their backyard. There were many incidents such as the bombing of a plane to transport escaped comrades out of the country. This was the start of the regime's effort to suppress, of Supreme's all out effort to suppress the struggle. 90 day without deten 90 day detention without trial commenced that year on the 2nd May 1963. Many comrades would be tortured in the months to follow. July 63 saw the Ravonia arrests and later, when the case came to trial, Jack would be cited as a co-accused. And so increasing attention was focused on the Betuanaland escape route. The British authorities were increasingly uncomfortable with Rika and Jack's presence and, con and their continued role in the escape route, which was drawing retaliation from apartheid South Africa. Soon they were declared prohibited immigrants by the British and were informed that they would have to leave the country or face charges. They refused and they were taken to court. They fought to stay in Botswana, in Bechuanaland. Their story made headlines both in Britain and South Africa. During this period, an attempt was made by the South African regime to kidnap them and they were defended in their flat by a team of men led by former treason trialist comrade Fish Kitsing, who played a pivotal role in the escape route. Eventually, Rika and Jack lost their court case and the British deported them to Britain via Dar es Salaam. At the airport in Dar es Salaam, they were welcomed on the tarmac by a demonstration of ANC comrades, some of whom had passed through the Bechuan land escape route. And that brings me to the um, uh, to the uh, video clip of their arrival by an East African Airways flight from Inland and Bayer. And I'll need to try and um, share the screen with you now. Oops, there we go. Oh, it's the end of the clip. Oh my goodness. <laughs> what happened there? Sorry, let me try and get this up again quickly. That's fine, you take your time, Spencer. Okay, thanks. <laughs> the, the ending looks so promising that we're lo looking forward to the full. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's see if I can share the screen with you now. Um, there we go. Oh dear. It's gone to the end again. I will try and start that once more. I beg your pardon, colleagues. Comrades. Spencer, it's probably easiest to put it onto the screen. It's on the screen now. And all I have to do is, um, is find the right way to share it. The problem is the share doesn't come up. And as I recall, I have to go to the uh, Zoom, um, what do you call it? The Zoom um, emblem, the blue, the little blue logo to be able to share it. So I'm gonna try that now. There's Zoom, let's try that. No, it's telling me to sign in. Hmm. Okay, I didn't 
quickly introduce Spencer. So while we're battling to, to get it projected, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Spencer, you are a graduate of Samosco. Uh, no, that's not true. <laughs> ah, <laughs> isn't it? Samofka. So we can't blame Samofka for your difficulties in... Uh, <laughs> no, certainly not. <laughs> we can blame the former GDR. Uh, yeah, no, the GDR. Oh, the GDR, yeah. Okay, it was the GDR. <laughs> uh, am I sharing the screen? Not yet. There's no sharing of screen. Not yet, no. Have you given me permission, Jenny? I have given you permission. That's strange. So if if the, the clip is open on your screen, if you click on the share screen icon at the bottom of your Zoom page, it should be... I have you clicked it, but it doesn't seem to want to share with you. I'll try clicking again. Mm -hmm. Can you see any screen there? No. Oh dear. Oh, that's dreadful. Um, it's not allowing me to share the screen. The, the the function for multiple participants sharing screen is on, so you should be able to. All, all that I can suggest is that if you if you send it to me quickly, um, I could then. I don't think so. It's it's huge. Um, oh, okay. Um, there, there, we go. there we go. There we go. on it. Perfect. Yes. Oh my goodness! What happened? Goodness me! Okay, here we go, Jeremy. Sorry about this. No problem. No problem. <laughs> okay, so what you are seeing now is um, Rika and Jack have arrived on this East African Airways from Mbeya uh, inland of, um, of, of in Tanzania. Um, they came up to Mbeya, they came under guard uh, by the British and they're disembarking here and at the foot of this staircase you see the British ambassador in Dar es Salaam. And um, he is fairly quickly dismissed uh, by Rika and Jack. And they see comrades in the on the tarmac and they rush to greet them. And first there is Comrade Duma Nokwe, yeah. South Africa's first black advocate and um, fellow treason trialist with Jack. And he's followed by comrade James Khadebi, who plants that kiss on Rika's cheek. And that kiss lands up uh, on the front page of the uh, Sunday Times in South Africa. And then there's comrade Moses Kotani, Secretary General of the Communist Party. Um, and I think, uh, is it moving on your side? Yes, sir. Yes, it is. A bit jumpy. And so they moved towards uh, the the airport. I don't know why it's not going. It's moving nicely. And finally, they meet um, with. Um, Comrade Abdullah Charlie, Charlie Jassett, uh, who was a member of MK and part of the sabotage campaign. And he had been arrested and brutally um, um, tortured uh, before escaping from Marshall Square and making his way to Bechuan Land. And finally, they find themselves at a press briefing in the, in, in the airport. And in the background there, is uh, Comrade Joe Modisu, who later, of course, that year, would go on to training in the Soviet Union. And next to him is Thomas Nkobi, who later mm -hmm. became Treasurer General of the ANC, and uh, Comrade Moses Kotani again. So the next morning, uh, Jack uh, and Rika left for London, where Rika would join the International Defence and Aid Fund, channeling funds into South Africa for the defense of political prisoners 
and the support of the families of political activists. In 1981, she joined me, my wife, Claudia, and our daughter, Tanya, at the Solomon Mishlanga Freedom College. That's where you got that from, Jeremy. Okay, okay. In Morogora. Yeah. Where she was secretary to the director, uh, Comrade Mohammed Tikli, and later uh, to Comrade Tim Maseko. On her return to South Africa, Rika was absolutely thrilled to be asked to become uh, secretary to Comrade Walter Susulu. And finally, Rika and Jack, of course, as you know, like many of you, were staunch internationalists. And while in England, they took part in demonstrations against uh, such as against uh, America's war in Vietnam. Until her death, Rika remained committed to the cause of the Palestinian people in their struggle against Israeli oppression. So I thank you for your patience, Jeremy, and your attention, everybody. Wonderful. Thank you, Spencer. That what, what, and so wonderful to see images. Uh, it was good it was moving slowly because it gave us a chance to ponder. Uh, <laughs> fantastic. Okay. Uh, that's it from your side, Spencer. That's it. I'll try and get... Uh, Jenny, are you going to dismiss me from here? Or do I need to do it myself? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Spencer. Uh, one, wonderful, wonderful input. Really very moving. Thank you. Um, so next up is uh, someone who worked, well, almost, I think, I think on the same floor, um, with, with Rika back in what was what Shell House, um, Comrade Jesse, uh, Jesse Duarte. So, Comrade Jesse, we're really looking forward to your uh, input. Thanks very much. Over to you. Thank you very much, Comrade Jeremy, and uh, good afternoon, comrades. It's uh, it's an honour to participate in this discussion. Uh, yes, I did. I worked with Rika as did Jenny Schreiner. And we, shared, we had offices right next to each other with no door that shut in between us. Um, so we could talk through the door. And um, I must say that firstly, it was a real privilege for me to work with someone as feisty as Rika was. Part of her job was special projects for Madiba. I never understood the special projects um, part, but I learned that Rika's job, uh, apart from taking care of every um, detail of Comrade Walters' Sulu's diary life, also had to reconnect Madiba with comrades that he had stayed with in various places throughout the country. And um, it was really a, a, a great privilege for me to see how Rika tackled uh, this task. You know, she, she had her friends, Amina Kachalia, she wrote them in. And on days, there would be quite a lot of people in her little office um, bringing together whoever Madiba had spent time with, with under, during the underground period. And so she, she traced the history of Madiba's movements throughout the country and made connections with various people. But for me, the, the real um, wonder of working with someone like Comrade Rika was you know, I couldn't, and I, and I think the, the, the title of this discussion is Red Carding Racism. And um, I have to say that over the last couple of years, I've become to feel that we are not being activists in the space to deal with the transformation of our society. We're accepting to a large extent that we came out of um, a very brutal, uh, almost decades of racism, 1990 arrives, people go to parliament, and there's an acceptance that as long as you see a few faces in the parliamentary seats and here and there, uh, a comrade who is um, perhaps a, a little different from other comrades, you've overcome racism in the country. So the visceral idea of, I can see that there's a Jesse, there's a Eric Hanukkah, there's Barbara Creasy, there's Jenny Schreiner, uh, et cetera. 
So, so we've de we're dealing with racism. We're dealing with the core of something that is really much bigger than looking at a few comrades who might um, have come into the positions, not because they are uh, from any particular race group, but because of the contribution they made. And for me that I, I have to uh, say comrades, you see, when you consider the period of the 40s, the 50s, the 60s and the early 70s, there was little or no discussion about when a person like Rika and Jack came into the struggle that they were white comrades who came in, they were making bombs in their kitchen because they saw that we had to change a particular system uh, in our country. Um, they also had a history, of course, of where their, their, their own heritages were from. And so for me, comrades, the, the current <laughs> discussion is a little offbeat. And I, I, I think I don't know if, if Comrade Khadeva is in this, in this group or in the discussion, but one of the things I've been saying to him is, so we're going to continue tackling one racist at a time. We're going to take them to the Human Rights Commission. We're going to fire them from the ANC. We're going to do uh, all manner of different issues, but we're not tackling the root causes and having a campaign in our country that actually looks at the national question and whether we are ready to do so. Um, I want to argue, and I hope comrades, this will stimulate some argument, that we simply fell into the trap of accepting the status quo as it was. We came back in 1990 um, <coughs> and all of us have been very comfortable to live, um, some, some of us just live in areas that where people don't know each other. Yes, the areas might be mixed, um, but the apartheid racial construct is very much here to stay. The provinces that we developed, and we didn't argue against them, um, literally developed tribalism right there and then. Um, we have, uh, with the exception of the Western Cape and Gauteng, perhaps all other provinces have been located into a particular tribal perspective. Secondly, that we are not rejecting racism, and nor are we looking at what it means to, uh, you know, this rejection of ra racism, does it actually mean that we are incapable of looking at the racial experiences and realities of the past, which actually persist in the present? And I'm quoting from a paper written by Raymond Sutner. Um, I'm not sure when he wrote this paper, but fairly recently. So we, we would look at people who are out and out arguing uh, for hegemony um, and, and, and some of those people unfortunately are in the movement. If we look at Kosatu, just as an example, the top leadership of Kosatu has one woman from the Western Cape representing the South African uh, Clothing and Textile Workers Union. Um, and so what has happened to all workers from other particular um, we, what happened to workers who come from other areas of our country, other, let me say, race, race groups. We've changed our language. Many of us were simply black, and I still regard myself as simply a black woman. But recently we've become minorities or colored. I despise that, um, that categorization because I didn't choose it for myself. It was derogatory right from its very origin. But within our language now, we speak about the colored comrades. We speak about the Indian comrades, uh, forgetting that uh, you know, for more than 150 years, people have come as indentured laborers and have become South Africans in, in the content of their work. And let's also look at another issue. Racism really does exist in, in some areas. Paulo Jordan points out in his paper that he writes that Colored people in Cape Town do not see themselves as black and therefore do not identify with this identity of being a black person. And there's almost a rejection of people who are African 
And is that historical and should we leave it as it is because it is his historical? Is it not also about looking at resources and how people see resources having been apportioned on a racial basis historically for centuries? And even now, as we do service delivery, are we not doing exactly the same thing and not delivering services evenly throughout communities and simply avoiding some areas and saying, but they, and I quote, from comrades who live in the Lanasia area, they benefited from apartheid and they are already uh, developed. So we don't need to give services. We don't need to cut the grass. We don't need to look at the children who live in that area. And then I'll come to a controversial issue, which has been very much in the public space. We have a mayor in Valcom who passes a group of very drunk young children. And from within himself, deep within himself, he calls them drunk busmana. And he's very repentant, of course, but this is a comrade who's considered to be quite developed, uh, comes from the structures of the ANC, has been around for decades, worked in the UDF campaigns, um, is well known, um, and yet from within himself, those children are not his children. They are not part of his community of children. They are drunk busmana. Um, we haven't passed the point of analyzing the national question in this country. We haven't. We haven't even started, I don't think so. And I think that it's, it's beyond looking at, um, looking at representativity. Because people now look at representativity and they say, okay, there's this group um, who ident group identification, such as the Khoisan and, and uh, some of the people in, that, in the Khoisan community who now took the government to court so that they can have individual people being represented on a ward by ward basis. And where does that come from? I've engaged that group. I know many of them. Some of them were from Rivoli. Uh, where, where we worked, and some of them were activists, and this is what they say. They say that the Africanization of the ANC has deprived us of an ability to be recognized as people and to be represented from our communities and our ward, and instead we are <clears throat> only represented by one racial group. Now, I'm not sure that we've ever discussed this in the Secretariat of the Alliance. I can't remember that it, that it was, and I'm, I'm 66 years old, and I'm sitting by myself for three months now, and um, my, memory, my memory is a bit uh, weird, you know? But I must say that um, I think we're in trouble, and I think that uh, we are not theorizing at all the dynamic that we face. And I think what all we're doing is we um, are dealing with it with putting a little plaster on, on the saw by tackling one racist at a time and taking them to various institutions or uh, charging them uh, according to the law and so on. But it isn't really tackling the fact. And I'm going to be very blunt. In KZN, the dynamic is quite serious whereby very advanced ANC comrades are not willing to accept people of Indian origin readily. And the reason they put is because of the racism from the Indian community towards the African community. And they do not see that they are intentionally or unintentionally themselves creating a race dynamic. Uh, in the organization itself. So have we tackled it? I would say no. All we did was make sure that one or two comrades from Mir Bank and other areas are represented in the PEC, um, a white, one white comrade, and that is non-racialism. It is not. It is not building a non-racial society. Do I have answers at this moment? I think we have to do a lot of research, but not just research. We have to do a great deal of activism. 
and also a great deal of undoing opportunism because there's also a great deal of opportunism arising out of the inactivity of the movement to deal with this matter. So you have Tula Mele and uh, the dynamic in Limpopo, which is more of a tribal dynamic. But uh, dealing with it, what did we do? We, became, we put principle aside and became pragmatic and simply wanted to re and have redesigned the, the, de uh, the, the demarcations so that you would separate Venda speaking people from Shangan speaking people because the complaint was Venda speaking people are not servicing the Shangan speaking community on the opposite side of the road. And I'm sad to say that there was an argument that said, why not give the people what they want? And I, I'm putting that challenge to us. And I'm saying, are we ever going to have a situation where every South African is simply a citizen, is entitled to services, uh, irrespective of their race or the language that they speak? Are we ever going to get to a point where when we demarcate um, areas, we are conscious of the fact that we are demarcating for citizens and not for language and race groups? And I'm, I'm sure we're not there yet. So to me and to many others that I speak to, there's a growing chauvinism on all sides. So self-assertion of, of people and identity politics is seen as chauvinistic and Africanization. Do we write it off simply as a wrong thing until and, and problematize it until we inculcate the value of non-racialism within our society and primarily within our structures. Uh, I, I am concerned that as we, as we move forward, we are simply um, papering the cracks and we are saying, as long as, uh, sorry, there's interference. For as long as you have Jesse and Derek and Barbara and Praveen in the NEC, we covered. You know, we covered. Um, and why do we, we need to go beyond that? And you go to a meeting and there's no participation of people from all various communities in meetings in the ANC any longer. The participation in the Joburg, um, broader Joburg area, if you go to an activist forum, would not be non racial. It would actually feel like you're attending a meeting of the PAC in the 1960s. Even the debate and the argument becomes very transactional. And, and my last point comrades is this, the automated um, incumbency issue where a chairperson of a, of a branch is automatically your next counselor. The chairperson of the branch would be from the majority grouping in the area. Um, so your councils end up having to have PR counselors from other race groups because that's the only way that we can actually assert non-racialism. I think therein lies the problem. Um, we're not looking at self-conscious analysis and understanding which takes us closer to transformation of our society we're actually walking away from it. And, and so what will opportunists do? Opportunists who are seriously not good leaders are beginning to emerge in the movement as representatives of colored Af uh, Indian and white communities. And that I personally am really beginning to worry about that because are we not, um, consciously debating this so that we move away from this um, uh, plastic way of dealing with a very real issue. And, and, and I'm sure, Comrade, uh, I should have quoted Lenin and I should have quoted all the people that we normally quote. I chose not to do that today um, because I just wanted to speak as myself. I, I'm speaking as an activist that is really concerned. And uh, I won't stop speaking. I've, I've gone wherever I have in every platform to raise the issue. But I also realize that 
it's a bit of a lonely space right now because not everybody is raising the issue. Uh, you know, some comrades are, and others are beginning to send me messages to say, you sound like a stuck record. I think it's good to be a stuck record because if I'm not a stuck record, um, this issue is going to be undermined as another one of those issues that, you know, we'll, we'll go to the next conference of the ANC and we'll have the same way of thinking. So comrades, let me just say, as I'm speaking on a platform of the South African Communist Party, the vanguard of our struggle, this is a struggle that is worth having. The, na the, the, quest the national question, properly analyzed, properly debated and properly discussed, the transformation of our society to a non-racial one, cohesion is a very important issue and we're not going to have cohesion for as long as we continue along the path of having provinces that emulate tribal um, enclaves. And we begin already, and I'm not dis, uh, being uh, dismissive of the traditional leaders of our country, but we're already beginning in a very awkward way to pay serious homage to patriarchy that is emulated by traditional leaders as if that is a good thing to do. And we argue that we need the traditional leaders of our country. I'm not saying that we don't, but I'm saying it's very dangerous to believe that um, we, we're transforming our society and we can live with both the patriarchs, non-racialism side by side, as well as the transformation of our society uh, as, per the, uh, as per the National Democratic uh, Revolution's idea. So comrades, uh, let, let me stop there and just say that privilege, expectation, protecting patronage, um, all of these are linked together to maintain a hierarchy of racism in our country. And we are creating a new hierarchy of racism uh, ourselves. So I, I, Jenny, I don't know if by inviting me you weren't quoting uh, controversy, but I wrote in my little book, um, don't be afraid to be controversial because no, no um, debate ever starts with a nice, um, wonderful, calm, yeah. and so on. But I also just want to go back to Comrade Rika and say this. You know, she had absolutely no consciousness in herself. Red, give me all the peanuts. Where you put them? Comrade Alec Naidu is um, must must mute. Uh, she had no consciousness of race within herself. To Rika, as far as I could tell, she was an activist. She was the person who had things to do and, and perform tasks for the ANC. And she actually didn't care what she herself was. Uh, I didn't get that sense working right next to her under very difficult circumstances, I might add. Uh, comrade Alec, Comrade Alec Naidu, sorry, could, do you mind muting? Sorry, sorry to, to interrupt. So this is where I'll end, Comrade Jeremy, and I'm, ho I'm hoping that Jeremy's smile will come back and I'm seeing that he's, he's frowning. <laughs> <laughs> there it's there, Comrade Jesse. Thank you, Thank very, you very, much. very much. Thank you said you. you didn't quote Lenin, but um, you were truly Leninist in your input. Um, you, you're absolutely right. We need to stir controversy. We need to open up a serious debate uh, in this area. So thanks very, very much. I'm looking forward to the discussion that will follow. Um, but first, we'll move over to Comrade Solly, our first uh, Deputy General Secretary. Comrade Solly, over to you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Comrade JC, and um, greetings to Comrade Spencer and the Hoxon family, uh, Comrade uh, Jeremy as the chair and member of our Central Committee and members of our Central Committee present here in this platform. Uh, across the different structures, I've seen comrades from provinces and some districts who have joined. 
um, and also to greet the leadership of the ANC, led by the DSG comrade Jesse Juate, uh, who has not failed the task of uh, uh, controversy in this space. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with being controversial, comrade Jesse. Uh, uh, Jesse. And I think uh, comrade Jeremy is right. You were a true uh, Leninist. You pointed out the clear points of contradiction and that's where we, we are seeking uh, solutions to them. And other members of the NEC who are here um, uh, and others who are in their own right as activists and also having uh, different responsibilities even in our democratic government, uh, we pass our greetings to all of these comrades. Um, I think um, it's also important to say as we start to recognize that yesterday we were burying uh, Comrade J.K. Ngadimeng, uh, Istala and Safarangwe, uh, stalwart of our movement. And it might be important uh, for a second to accord him a moment of silence in his honor. Amanda, thank you very much, uh, comrades. And of course, uh, just to pick up where Comrade Jesse had uh, left off, to appreciate that this is the Women's Month and we're dealing with a, a very niggling issue that Comrade Spencer also addressed uh, of um, sexism in our society, as well as the uh, uh, persistent uh, stubborn patriarchy. Comrade Jesse as well uh, uh, spoke to this particular question. Our struggle to build a new society will effectively be realized once we tackle this uh, question, the, the gender question in our society. But in its interrelation as well with tackling the national question that Comrade Jesse highlighted and uh, identified clearly. And I think uh, Comrade uh, Jesse, we in the Communist Party, we must take full responsibility for this matter because we do actually uh, not only accord ourselves, but research shows we're the first non-racial organization on the African continent, not only in South Africa, um, unless it's proved otherwise, but um, formally we're the first uh, fully non-racial organization, not only because of that, but obviously because of how colonialism uh, played itself uh, on the continent, uh, South Africa becoming one of the first industrial countries uh, bringing in many people from all over the world, uh, the Indian indentured labor uh, that Comrade Jesse spoke about, spending now almost over 150 years, and uh, now with deep roots uh, in South Africa, um, the Chinese labor coming in, and many others, uh, those from Europe and other parts uh, of the world. So therefore, it's very important to also appreciate uh, the constellation of uh, race uh, in the South African context. But at the same time, go deeper to understand the origins of racism. And of course, I think in doing so, not becoming an academic, and I, I didn't prepare my notes uh, from an academic uh, posture as well. I, I took uh, perhaps the posture of Comrade Jesse, which would allow perhaps uh, many other areas to still be followed up and be engaged with that colonialism itself um, and its uh, broader offshoots, uh, imperialism, capitalism itself, narrow nationalism, lack of integration, and the necessity to continue to fight for a non-racial society becomes issues that we need to, to trace and deal with so that we are, we, are, we are able to fully understand our current challenge as a movement and also trace why our people, for instance, later on, uh, when you trace uh, South Africa's own uh, uh, developments from um, anti-colonial struggle, for instance, as well as anti-imperial capitalist struggles of our broad people, um, including our forefathers um, in defense of the land uh, from colonial occupation, how that will, uh, has shaped some of the conditions that we have today. And I must uh, indicate that uh, it is important that in contextualizing racism in South Africa, uh, 
we have also to, to go deeper to understand how it was fought as an integral part of the broader national liberation struggle. That we have never, uh, 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 for instance, particularly from the point of view of, uh, of, of the Communist Party, um, shifted uh, our responsibility in the fight against colonial uh, oppression, imperial oppression, as well as racist uh, oppression now formalized through the apartheid regime. We have never shifted our responsibilities uh, in this regard. And therefore, what we require at the moment also is to unify our resistance to pertaining legacies of racism. The same way in which our movement was reorganized as a response to colonial oppression and its racist attitudes, because racism in South Africa didn't come with a, a, a apartheid. Apartheid just legislated it. It has been in existence for quite some time uh, since the occupation of our country. And therefore, the unit of resistance against sex, uh, uh, racism today requires a broad movement that understands this task. Namely, if we were to look at the formation of the African National Congress, uh, the movement by Pixley, Saga Kassem, and others who largely responded to uh, uh, the peace treaty of Erenachin, for instance, between the, the, the Boers and the, and, the, and the British who fought in our country, fighting for our land. And when they make a peace deal, they exclude the Africans. And uh, as a result, in, the, in, in terms of their peace accord, they start imposing unnecessary uh, laws and legislations, which uh, some of our leaders fought uh, vehemently particularly Chief Zondi of the Bambata Rebellion, who signified that particular response to the peace treaty of Verenachen and perhaps uh, even the general development of the country, the development of capitalism, which sought to exclude the majority of the, of the population except to use them as cheap labor in, in the joining uh, mining industry, particularly the diamond mines, as well as later on the gold mines and so forth. So it is therefore important that the movement which has embraced the whole system of the National Democratic Revolution, which responded to British imperialism against national oppression and to redefine South Africa's own national question, which was finally uh, uh, synthesized by our people when they adopted the Freedom Charter in 1955 and they declared that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, black and white, and that no government shall claim authority unless it is based on the will of the people. Later on in the same Freedom Charter, they reaffirmed that this freedom set out uh, in the Freedom Charter shall be fought for side by side until we have won our liberties. But our liberties didn't mean re-deepening uh, 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 tribal uh, 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 freedoms, if you like, uh, racial freedoms. It basically sought to redefine a new country that is non-racial, non-sexist, that is broadly prosperous and sharing all the resources amongst the people. It is in this regard that the unity of resistance against a new form of racism which a democratic government is basically maybe not perhaps unable to respond to effectively, but unable to tackle it head on. And I think that's this one big question that we need to highlight. What is the primary platform of racism today? Is it embedded in economic construct, in social construct? Uh, and whatever it is embedded on, I think that those of us in the movement who are now responsible for government have the political power basically to change. But if we, we, we refrain from acting in pursuit of the fundamental objectives of the Freedom Charter, we will not be able to tackle racism in the manner that uh, we are supposed to. We will also allow unnecessary tendencies to emerge and flourish even within our ranks. 
Comrade Jesse, I think, had spoke at length about uh, this, this particular matter. But I think it's critical, Comrade JC as well, to indicate that Comrade Rika Hobson and many white compatriots who gave their lives to South Africa, uh, not only because, like Comrade Rika, who was born uh, long ago in 1920 here in this country, uh, has a birthright. And sometimes in this country, when people discuss racism, they take away the birthrights of people. A fundamental construct in citizenship is taken away just simply because you are not so-called African enough or black enough. And I fully agree with uh, uh, the pointers that Comrade uh, uh, Jesse is raising. Yes, this campaign to red cut racism should be taken forward uh, firstly, in memory of Comrade Rika Oxon, who herself has demonstrated her commitment to the people of this country, to this continent, to a non-racial world and future that uh, we should be enjoying today. Instead, we are regressing because of our narrow nationalist tendencies, our narrow pan-Africanism, because Comrade Rika's pan-Africanism was not defined by narrowness of boundaries. That's why she was internationalist. She was able to work from everywhere. And when her dear husband and partner died, uh, when she was in Europe, she left back to, 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 back to Africa, to, to Tanzania, to help the movement. Wholeheartedly had given herself to the aspirations of the majority of the people because she was a true Democrat and she never understood uh, or even believed like many in our movement that a democracy wherein in a country the majority are African will actually mean oppression for so-called minorities. So it is very important that we appreciate and deal with this matter as a movement comprehensively, not just pay rhetoric affirmations to this question of uh, non-racialism. I think one day we were having a debate with some comrades, um, and I raised this matter also in, a, in, the, in, a, in our party. When one comrade actually even in, in one particular forum, Comrade Jesse will know this forum, when one particular comrade was actually trying to say, in this composition, let's look into a, 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 actually wanted a, a racial profile. And I think that it's a great disservice to our movement. We're paying lip service to a principle of our struggle of non-racialism. It's not just a mere policy. It's a principle of our struggle. So we are affirming that this principle, our struggle can never be achievable without affirming all its key principles. Non-racialism, non-sexism, as well as to end class exploitation. These are integrated and therefore, we have also to look into racism in South Africa today in the context of continued crisis of social reproduction. That we as a movement who are controlling political power are not using that power to change both the structural foundation of this crisis of social reproduction in our society that continues to deepen inequality and poverty and along racial lines that is lacking in integration of society. In some instances, when you look at uh, some of the integrations, they are one-sided in, in the manner that uh, 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 they are being done. So it is critical that to deal with this uh, legacy, we also have to tackle the crisis of social reproduction in our society. But South Africa is regressing in its achievement towards a non-racial society. We are not becoming inclusive enough uh, as a movement broadly uh, because of our narrowness and how we're looking at things. And I think it is critical that in this regard, we need bold and non-racial champions that must be affirmed, not only from a higher excellence in government, but at all levels. For instance, how do we tackle racism inside the ranks of the liberation movement? where this matter is given lip service, is not tackled proper. Comrade Jesse was given an example 
of one comrade recently who was attended to. And I mean, of course, respecting uh, internal processes and structures of our movement, one believes that uh, perhaps we could uh, take much more stronger action than what we have done in recent times. And it is in this regard that we we'll have to agree on a rolling out of a strong campaign and program to end racism in our society, in, in, ensure that all our government programs respond effectively to this question. I can give you an example. You know, our communities, Comrade Jesse is right. When we launch our campaign for basic services, the Know and Act in Your Neighborhood campaign, we went to El Dorado Park, for instance. One thing that we found there was completely unacceptable. Garbage not collected for months. And we had to not only clean the garbage ourselves, but they had struggled to get the city to respond to the removal of that particular garbage. And we set up a small team to continue to make sure that there's continued service of that particular area. But these are areas that I, I have been forgotten. Now, that image, the Communist Party launched a cleaning campaign. In fact, we broadened that particular cleaning campaign across the country. But it was largely informed by some of the experiences we have had in places like El Dorado Park, who are completely ignored for many services across the board. I hope now that this matter has been, it's, it's been tackled and it's actually changing, given that um, uh, 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 the movement, it's once again, although even at that particular time, it was as we were empowering in Johannesburg when we were not serving that particular area. But I think this, this matter is uh, actually uh, uh, changing. But we need to be quite clear as a movement about how to deal with uh, racial bigotry, both in society and inside our own ranks. And that perhaps the training of comrades on our core principles should not be traded with uh, factional politics in the movement. That if a particular comrade belongs to a, a certain faction, he's doing many things wrong, he's a racist, he's a tribalist, and so forth, we can't tackle that particular comrade because he belongs to a big faction that is dominant, either in a region or province or even national. So the movement has to be clear in the affirmation of its own principles, and particularly dealing with this question of uh, uh, racism. And I think that the regression that we see will require that not only the ANC as a leading movement and its leaks needs to relook re into its policies, the SACP itself and its Young Communist League need to look into their policies. Are they affirming this matter properly? COSATU and its affiliates too must look into this matter. The broader youth, student, and women's movement, as well as progressive organization, the mass democratic movement in our society, and progressive civil society organizations, they must look into their policies about this question. How are we doing? Rather than regressing. We have uh, had some ideas where, for instance, we were taking this question of decolonization. And many people, and particularly young people, think that when we talk about decolonization, everything non-Black must, must be attacked. It's incorrect, has no space in our society. They don't go to the actual formation of society. They don't address the class question. There's also an emergence even of a bigger group of white working class that is extremely suffering in this country. And a democratic movement can't pay lip service to this particular question just because of racial, uh, past racial inequalities and racism that we are tackling, even though the Africans are in majority in political leadership of the country. Therefore, it is important to also use this opportunity as a movement to look at the contributions of a wide range of uh, white compatriots, for instance, as well as those categorized broadly, black compatriots 
women of Indian origin and others. That we can't forget, for instance, for a moment, ourselves as a revolution. The singular contribution and many other contributions of people like Joe Slow. How do you even regress to think that uh, the contributions, immense contribution of a person like Joe Slobo should be racialized? Comrade Jess is right. Uh, in the past, this question never arose when uh, these comrades were taking the most difficult task of our revolution. One of the immediate and non-racial formations broadly in the movement was MK, for instance. If you look at its composition across the board, you will see the patriots who were willing to give their lives for freedom for all in this particular country across racial lines. And therefore, it will be important that we do not forget you are Yusuf Dadu, you are Helen Joseph, Lillian Dedricks, Red September, J.B. Marx, the Colossal Marx, Rusty Bainstein, Hilda Bainstein, all of these individuals who were not classified as so-called Africans or Blacks, but are Africans. Ahmed Katraga, for instance, Dennis Goldberg, Wolfie Kodesh, as we were speaking about this comrade of uh, uh, Comrade Rika and Mandiwa's special project, one of the persons that, for instance, introduced Madiba to a better way and approach to non-racism was Comrade Wolfi Gwedesh, when Madiba took refuge in his flat. So when they were doing all those MK experiments, he was staying at Gwedesh's place until he was exposed by that, uh, 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 by his love for sour milk. <laughs> and some, <laughs> some guy came and said, hey, this man who's drinking sour milk, <laughs> there should be a black guy here. <laughs> And Madiba realized that now is the time to leave Wolfie Godesh's place. But he writes about, for instance, how Wolfie, so respectful, different from why, uh, uh, racist, white, and it inspired him for the non-racial project of our country. And these are things that we cannot just simply forget because of narrow nationalism, just right for political expediency in our country. Who will forget, comrades, the contributions of Bob Heppel, billionaire, Bram Fischer, ah, the most uncelebrated of our heroes, Bram Fischer. I mean, this is just unbelievable. Uh, Ahmed Timon, we've been talking about him and actually finalizing his case and making sure that the racists who killed him pay the price. Nana Abrams, Sam Khan, Brian Banton, Esther Bassel, the indefatigable Esther Bassel who always organized the working class. She didn't care. She mobilized for the movement. You'll go to Yorville at the taxi rank. You'll see one woman distributing leaflets of the movement at the taxi rank, even in her old age. So all of these people, Lalo Chiva, Ruth Frest, Bea Snowden, and many others, James Naguma, Fred Kanison, Krish Naido, and countless thousands of revolutionaries who were not so classified as Blacks in your typical lexicon. I think it will be extremely unfair to this revolution that we all forget about them just because we want to affirm our so-called narrow Africanism. The, our movement has never been like that. In fact, we fought very bitter struggles to reaffirm our people and the people as a whole through the Congress of the People in, in, in Cape Town reaffirmed our common humanity that we belong together, that we are interlinked and we are one people and we have to get rid of all these other biographies of narrow nationalism and embrace one another and build one country, one people that is equal across the board, egalitarianism, in our, our access to resources, in our own way of living, integrate our schools and so forth. And I think that it is right, is that perhaps the right time that the movement has to deeply reflect on its own failures. Because this is where the problem is. And I fully agree and endorse this, this framework, Comrade Jess. The party has actually raised it in the Alliance Political Council. This question about provinces. In fact, the next Congress of the African National Congress must just take a firm decision 
to get rid of provinces in the way that they are. They are taking us back as a country in terms of coordination and our inability to respond to crises and difficulties faced by our society as a whole. We're responsible for the rest of South African society, not for one group of people. So it is therefore important that we can't forget the social work that Comrade Rika Watson did in service of all the people, risking her own family, her own children, spends and them. He, they, they, they talk about how, for instance, in the selflessness of their own family, their own children were endangered. They live difficult lives. Of course, Spencer in his own right, he acknowledges that, you know, but uh, coming to, to, to contact with such uh, wonderful people, Madiba, Sisulu, and many others from the African communities, uh, also was wonderful moments for them. But their parents lived a very difficult lifestyle, and many others. They held the party, the party congress in 1960, Comrade Jeremy, was, was, was held uh, in, in, in Sirildin, uh, organized underground in a white suburb, underground with African comrades participating in this. So today, if we are to remember the real foot soldiers of our freedom, as Comrade Rika Oxen was and wrote in a book, which by the way, when I shared with Silo Magaganjube the other time, and he wanted to cry and he said, Soli, I'm coming to her memorial and I'm going to do a poem. He read that book incessantly. He summarized that through the poem that actually we should have played that keep ourselves uh, to join Comrade Spencer's uh, uh, little video clip. We must make it, make it available on our website, Comrade Alex and others. Where Silma Kanyube, for instance, we had never properly came into contact with such a, a, a heroine. And when he read the book, within a few days, he was able to construct such a moving poem, which he actually gave at, at, at the memorial. Because it touched his heart, his heart that actually we ourselves are ignoring where we come from as a society. And we can't allow that to, to, to happen. A comrade um, Rika and her family who suffered greatly, as you know, she, she fundraised for all our people. Uh, both for the uh, 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 prison trial, as well as for the defense aid, international defense aid, to make sure that when our leaders across the board were in prison, they could organize legal defense for them. They could organize some care for their families because they lost their breadwinners. So all of a sudden, because we have access to resources, access to even tenders that we must do away with, we now think that everything belongs to those who are as black as me. And I'm very proud to be a, 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 a black, but this doesn't define me. I'm a class person too. And I think it's, it's critical to appreciate the contributions of many of our uh, 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 compatriots and deal with racism once and for all in this country. We can tackle it, Comrade Jesse. And uh, Comrade uh, uh, Jesse, we can tackle racism through a broad campaign as a movement Without apology to this, this is actually against the grain of our constitution. Those of us who other complaints, in fact, at any point in our liberation struggle, there's no way, for instance, our leaders can say they were on their own without our, our, uh, the, the so-called uh, uh, non-African leaders. There's not even a single segment. So it is critical that we appraise this and put it back into the lexicon. That also means that even in our own uh, development of our syllabi uh, in schools, we have to integrate our revolutionary struggle. Otherwise, the, this memory will soon be forgotten and will not be able to have reference and will only think that uh, those of us who are as uh, black as I am are the only ones entitled to enjoy the fruit of freedom. We'll forget about those who planted bombs, including one on our, on our screen now, uh, Comrade who's hosting us here, uh, uh, Jenny Schreiner, who planted bombs for the liberation of, uh, of, of the country. She was not saying that the, the, the black people, when they get liberated, they must come and oppress her and her children and her family just because she's white. So this question has to be raised sharply and we must sharpen the contradiction about the national question 
the racial question, we understand that it doesn't necessarily mean that where we are, we have dealt away with racism. Just because we talk about it, there's no racism in society. But we mustn't allow that to be so insurmountable that we can actually undermine our own principles and the contribution of such heroines and people as Comrade Rika walks in. Let me bring, uh, leave it there, Comrade Chair, and say we remain grateful as the Communist Party to our great interventions and memory of Comrade Rika and how many other white compatriots have contributed to the liberation of our struggle. And that these struggles we shall fight for side by side until we've won our liberties, as the Freedom Charter says. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very, very much, Comrade Solly. Uh, very passionate as always. And uh, yeah. Okay, so what, what we're gonna do now is open up for discussion, debate and so forth. If I could try just to make a few points, uh, hopefully which will assist that discussion. So there are some paradoxes. So let me begin with the first paradox that in the 1950s, the organizations in which Comrade Jack and Rika and others were active were actually racially defined organizations, the Colored People's Congress, the Congress of Democrats for Whites, the Indian Congresses, and of course, the African National Congress. And yet, in what, in what Comrade uh, Solly has so passionately remembered now, and Comrade uh, Jesse before that has remembered, is that somehow, despite the way in which representativity within the Congress movement was organized, there appears to have been less internal ethnic and racial um, attitudes, maneuvers, and so forth. Of course, they weren't entirely absent naturally in a country like our own. So that's the first thing I want to think about. The second thing that I want to um, observe is that something very interesting happened. I was mostly aware of it in the Cape Town area, and it possibly happened elsewhere as well, um, is that at the height of the very tough lockdown, that a whole series of community action networks, CANs as they were often called, developed. Many of them in sort of uh, suburbs, now partially deracialized suburbs. Hmm? Um, but still of, often predominantly white. But also other cans developed in places like uh, Hanover Park and uh, Kailicha and so forth in Cape Town. And what you saw was at, at, a, at a popular level, there was joint actions of a, of a thoroughly non-racial kind, which is very interesting. Um, so the one can that I was aware of uh, in the sort of central uh, Cape Town area, organized um, to ensure that as many homes as possible paid for their absent domestic workers who couldn't come to work and who shouldn't come to work, but nonetheless ensured that they were paid. Um, uh, another can was involved in purchasing um, food garden vegetables from Kailicha, where that can was continuing to address the, the food crisis, but they would also then go and purchase some of them and then distribute them to street people living in the area and so on. So what you saw there was non-racialism in action, okay, across classes um, and across, uh, you know, racial divisions of one kind or another. But singularly absent, I mean, the, the, I think there were many, there were ANC comrades and SACB comrades involved in these, Comrade Sheila for one, I think was uh, Comrade Sheila uh, Basel was involved in her observatory at CAN. But what is, but by and large, organizationally, the ANC, the SACP, Kasatu locals insofar as they still exist, I think were by and large absent from these processes. So I, I want us to think about that. And then to ask the question, because what Comrade Jesse in particular was talking a great deal about was the way in which representativity inside of the ANC to get to be a counselor, uh, to get the tender perhaps even, um, that, that representativity has become monetized, has become career option. So when comrades gathered in the Berea flat of the Hodgkins to manufacture explosives and bombs and things like that, it wasn't about a career and it's, well, it was about a 
a, a career that was very dangerous and would end you in jail or exile or whatever. So is, 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 is the problem, is part of the problem the way in which our organizations, the movement generally, and the ANC obviously because it is the fast track into um, positions in government, in councils, in, in, you know, and, and so on, it, is that part of the problem? That, that, that kind of victimhood and the degree of which to which you were victimized uh, as an African person and so forth versus a, a so-called colored person versus obviously a white person and so on. Those things have now become monetized and used and the whole game of victimhood is also played a great deal in that. So how do we think about that aspect of things? The very last point I want to, want to make is that, um, you know, Lenin said that it was the job of Russian, short, of Russian nationality to defend the national independence aspirations of oppressed nationalities in the, the Tsarist empire. And I think we must be careful. I mean, it was great, what, what's, I, it was wonderful what Solly was saying, but I think particularly those of us who are white, but all of us as South Africans need at the same time, and I'm not suggesting that either Jesse or Solly were doing this, we mustn't forget the national grievances uh, and, and, and the way in which still deferentially um, race is a, is a massive factor in terms of uh, historical disadvantage uh, and, and ongoing oppression. The same obviously applies to patriarchy. So our non-racialism, and certainly neither Solis nor Jesse's is, 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 is that, but it mustn't become colorblind. And that's why I've always thought, we talk about the national question because that's an, a, a kind of communist tradition, but the, 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 there's also a national answer <laughs> to the national question. And that, that is the leadership of African people in the South African reality, uh, joined by others, but the national grievance, the national, you know, so, and that's why we have a national movement. So in order to deepen the controversies and hopefully uh, facilitate the discussion, let's then move to, to, to uh, uh, having a question and answer. And I'm recognizing um, uh, could, uh, could comrades uh, put up hands They're under the participant uh, logo at the bottom? Um, we, there, there's the possibility to raise hands. I'm not seeing any yet. I know that Jenny Schreiner, who's the host, can't hoist her hand, but has indicated it to me in a message that she would like to raise. So Jenny, could you come in? Thanks, thanks, um, comrade Jeremy, and thanks very much to both comrade, or to all, uh, comrade Spencer, comrade Jesse, and, and comrade Solly in, in the, the way in which these contributions have come together, really inspiring and a very strong message coming through that we need to uh, make sure that this, this webinar this afternoon becomes a, a very systematic campaign. I was very struck in comrade Spencer's clip of the, the bond that connected those comrades as they greeted each other. And Comrade Jesse referred to the fact that uh, sharing the 10th floor with, with Comrade Rika, there was no sense of um, any racial consciousness from Comrade Rika. I would equally say that there was also no racial consciousness from any of the other veterans who we were honored enough to share that floor with. Um, Comrade Walter Susulu was on that floor. At no stage did one have any sense that he was relating to anybody on that floor with any racial consciousness at all. Um, so whether he was interacting with Comrade Jesse or myself or any of the other um, African comrades who were on that floor, we were comrades on the 10th floor, we had a job to do, um, but he was also an enormous um, person of humaneness who would also come and check on whether we were okay. And again, across the board. So for me, part of what we need to be also looking at is that non-racialism, that understanding of uh, the principles of, of our revolution is something that has to be instilled in all of us. Um, and I, I think for me, sometimes we, when we're talking racism, when we're talking about non-racialism, we start talking about racism as if it comes from a group or non-racialism as if it should come from another group. And in fact, it cuts across all of us, whether we are as black as Comrade Sully or as pale as, and I can legitimately say white because of the color of my hair, not because of anything else. 
um, we have to ensure that, that we take those, those issues forward. Comrade Sonny raised the question of what, our, what the primary platform of, of racism is. And I think for me, there are two dimensions that we need to not lose sight of. The one is the extent to which racism is embedded in the ongoing inequality. Um, and while we have that level of inequality built on top of the, the apartheid spatial geography, we are going to land up with, with um, the material conditions that generate uh, the, the, the tensions that involve in it. And I think that what we, what we need to be looking at very strongly is that the principle of our non-racialism is in fact rooted in the principle of humanity, the principle of humaneness. And it's that principle that should actually be informing um, our campaign, um, our ensuring that the, the life orientation and curricula of schools is changed to be able to, to address those issues. So I think for me, I would hope that as we move in, ironically or perhaps usefully, into Heritage Month, again, a Heritage Month in which we, we do not necessarily triumph with the social cohesion and the national um, non-racialism that, we, that we, we should be dealing with. How do we approach this Heritage Month with a very clear red carding racism campaign that can uh, assist us in, in taking forward some of, of those issues? So I thought that was just the, the, the issue that I would like to throw in. Thanks very much, uh, Comrade Jenny. I recognize Comrade Lefika. No, thanks, Comrade Jeremy. Uh, greetings, Comrades. Uh, I, I think that the, the interventions by, by all the, the speakers were, were quite profound, and it's important that we, we take this time to recall um, you know, leaders gone by, such as Comrade Vika, um, and and the the issue raised here, you know, under the the question of how we as as uh, organizations, as society, is going to to tackle the the gains that, or, or rather, the reversal of the gains that was fought for, that was achieved by generations we know that are are leaving us, or or have already left us. Uh, you know, largely. For, for those comrades that, um, that know me, uh, comrades know that, you know, one of the most inspirational uh, women leaders in our region for myself, not just in our country, in our region, is Justina Michelle. Uh, in, in her short span of life, she taught us um, the issue of, of how to be fearless. Up until the, the last moments of her very short-lived life, uh, Josina was on the forefront of, of the struggle for, for liberation in, in Mozambique. And in, today, you know, as, as activists, as, as communists, I think that we need to recall that type of of fiercelessness uh, of Comrade Rika uh, Hobson uh, and numerous leaders that, that have, have gone uh, before us. Um, yeah, let me pause there, Comrade Jeremy. Thanks. Okay, thank you, uh, Comrade Lafika. I'm looking for hands. Maybe, uh, right, uh, Comrade uh, Pam Trete. Hello, Comrade Pam. Hello, Comrade Ray. Uh, I would like to thank the presenters. Um, you, I was taking photos. You are reminding me, Comrade Spencer, while we are showing us the photos. When I reached Lusaka in 1985, uh, Comrade Mudise, all the, 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 those comrades that you showed in the picture, like they were, they were old at that time. So I saw them and I was taking all the pictures. I used to visit Comrade Raymond and the wife only on Sundays because there's nice food there, we eat. And then I would be invited by Comrade Zoukota and Comrade Miranda from Western Cape because 
they knew them from Western Cape. So, and James Nulu will then go there. They will tell us, you know, and, and educate us on issues that we don't know of is politics, let me say, political education. But I would like to touch on two issues. At the time that I was the deputy minister of rural development, with uh, I was deputizing uh, Minister Nguindi. I've learned so many things at, in that department that the, the Land Native Act 1913 and also the Group Areas Act 1950. Mm. And, and I was shocked to see how people were forcefully removed from their areas. And then after that, I was sent to Cuba and then I saw that in Cuba, there is something that we don't do in South Africa. We neglect the youth. Cubans at the, at, at the early stage or age of primary schools, you find uh, veterans having classes with children, teaching mm. them about the history of Cubans. And, and also mm. the high schools and wherever mm. you go, you see the pictures of leaders in, in Cuba, especially in Havana. They took us to museums. We found young children. They were listening to a veteran. And I saw this as something which is very, very good because Cubans, they will never lose the history of Cuba. What we don't do in South Africa, we only talk about 18 to 35 to join the Youth League. At the age of the primary school, the children are drinking. They don't talk about, we don't talk about politics. They do, we do nothing in schools. The, the education, the history is different. They don't talk about Mandela, especially the Model C schools. They don't know our history. That is why you find most of them joining the DA because our history is, is, is not the history. It's, they don't talk about Mandela. The land, uh, 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 land Act, the, the Native Act, the Group Areas Act. And Comrade Quinty, when I was telling him that what I saw in Cuba, mm -hmm. it's something that we don't do here in South Africa. He said to me, you know what, Pam? I have a dream. Let's go and do roadshow of land native. Uh, Native Land Act, showing and, and showing how people were removed, and the, the school kids were invited here in South Africa. We went to all provinces, and some children were crying. They were as young as, as primary schools were crying, sitting down, listening to the people that were telling them about the history of South Africa. And I thought that it's something that we don't do in South Africa. We have an art and, and culture that we should use. We, we have all the resources. We have museums that are um, just white elephants, those museums. I, I sometimes go in and check. I don't see any kids going there. If they are there, there is no one attending to them. We should have classes. Children going to museums, they are told about where we come from. And also some of the things that we don't do in South Africa because what I saw in schools now, uh, there is distorted history of, of African National Congress. And what a comrade Mapaila raised, which I think it's quite, uh, 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 when I thought of it, that provinces, if we don't deal with the issue of provinces, Western Cape now, I'm deployed there. Western Cape is becoming a federal country now. And the, we, we've launched, the, uh, 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 President Cyril Ramaphosa launched the, the district model, development model. And in some areas of our country's provinces, they, they are now implementing that uh, 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 development model. But in the Western Cape, I received, because when I was saying, I'm going to go to Western Cape, we wrote letters to, 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 to the premier to say, we, we, we want to implement this district model, development model. 
we've received letters to say we don't agree with this because this model i think the president was doing it so that we all work together as three, three spheres of government and what you said uh COVID, Mapaila, is that you wherever you go in south africa there is paper on the floor it's bananas all over refuse all over in big towns refuse because why that we don't do anything we've got all the policies we, we've got all the labor laws but we don't implement those and it's just full i, I i'm not xenophobic <laughs> my file, but i still I, I i have a problem of people that are coming here because when i compare rwanda because i also went to rwanda the president of rwanda said to us when he was briefing us you can travel here anytime they know if you steal we cut your hand they've got serious laws in this country that is why you find all of these people coming here and they don't have i mean they they come here we don't know them and i think comrades all comrades in the border they, they have a problem serious problem because these people are coming here forcefully coming here they are all over here and i want to repeat i'm not xenophobic but somebody was telling me yesterday that she was taking a walk to, to next to the beach and she was with the kids because the kids wanted to take photos. They saw this man coming and they didn't bother because they were taking photos. She took on there, but at the time that she was taking photos, the mother, and she happened to take the photo of this guy taking cell phones from these children. And then when she was coming to her and she screamed and then this man he had a big knife and coming to her and then luckily there were men around that came running and then she couldn't take a, 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 a cell phone but the photo is there when i looked at the photo it's not a south african and they know in their countries they don't do what they do here in south africa they know that there are strict laws and i think it's high time here in south africa we implement the policies the labor laws and everything and we, we want I know I was, I was checking also our relationship with Africa, we want a relationship with Africa, but I, I know that in some areas of Africa, like in Rwanda, no South African can go there and open a shop. It's, it's not allowed. But here in South Africa, they are taking over the shops, everything, the saloons is them. We don't say they must not be given. Maybe I will be corrected here, but it must, it, it can be in Joburg, you can't walk, it's, it's their territory, wherever you go, and they are not here to boost the country, there's nothing that they do, Somalians, they don't pay tax on these people, they have all the money, all the groceries, and sell rotten food, to up eat. nothing is happening in South Africa. Lastly, uh, without wasting time, I think I enjoyed this. And um, I want to thank Comrade Jesse for inviting me here. And I think that one of the things that we must do, we must deal this issue of tribalism. It's getting worse. Even here, um, I stay in the Eastern Cape. We still have the talk. People are saying these trans science, these cis science. I mean, it's still there, that thing. And I think once we get rid of the provinces and have one country, and come up with other systems, maybe this thing will end. I don't know. I thank you so much. Sorry. Uh, thank you, Comrade Pam. Uh, the, I'm not seeing other hands. Uh, Comrade Lucky Matome Bopapi, uh, in, a, in, a, in a message, said, um, raise the issue again, which, which Comrade Jesse in particular was talking to about uh, coloreds or so-called coloreds which are, who are the majority working class in the western cape and expressed a concern that we're losing support or have lost support from that quarter how do we think about it so that is one question i would like um uh, the, the panelists to 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 take further the uh comment uh, pam's last uh intervention the last aspect of, of of her intervention uh, raises the broader issue when we talk about non-racialism in South Africa, 
Comrade uh, Jesse grounded it in a sense of common citizenship. Comrade Jenny was suggesting that we should ground it in a common humanity. Okay, because if we regard our non-racialism as being, uh, obviously citizenship is an important dimension of our non-racialism, a recognition of a common citizenship. The danger, of course, of leaving it at citizenship is it raises issues around our attitude to non-South African citizens, um, many of whom or whose parents uh, and grandparents built the mines as Mozambican migrants, as, as Swazi migrants and so forth, uh, and helped to build the South African economy. So th that's, that's another dimension, which is not to diminish the challenges that very poor communities in South Africa are encountering with large numbers of refugees economic or political refugees coming into our country. So it's, it's another issue which touches on this, this dimension. Um, okay, uh, can I throw it over to you, Comrade uh, Jesse, to respond in however you would like. Oops, thank you very much, Comrade Jeremy and comrades. I think that was quite, um, quite good that we, and I've also been reading some of the messages which are really very rich. But I'd like to just go back to to three things first, if I may, is this question of the monetization of representativity. And uh, I think that if we look at the historically as well, how the National Party monetized, um, monetized representativity, where the capitalist class was the class that led because they were the rich people, we are going back in that direction inadvertently by providing money to people to buy votes, et cetera, and, and, and so on. And, and obviously um, this new idea that we must have representation at a ward level of individuals, very dangerous, very interesting, but very dangerous because what that will lead us to is exactly the capitalist class being the class that will dominate our politics because you're going to have to have money to persuade people that you are uh, a leader and and in that is a is is an issue i think we we also need to address is how do we get people to accept what jenny calls this common humanity and i agree with that i mean i used common citizenship and perhaps uh, it is narrow to use that base but for example you know the poorest people in our country are black and working class so i am not arguing that African people shouldn't be the leaders of this country. But I am arguing that it should not only be African people because then we're arguing against our own revolutionary uh, uh, construct of a non-racial South Africa. But at the same time, we also have to look at the lived experiences of people. And yeah, I'm going to raise an experience that Comrade Pam perhaps uh, in her findings on the ground, looking at the land question, may have come across. When in, in the 1950, towards the 1960s, when apartheid began to build large townships, they bulldozed a lot of land areas that belonged to other people. For example, District 6, uh, Comrade Pam, was completely annihilated to build uh, nothing, it's just standing there, it's empty, but to make sure that you would have a white living area that wasn't, as they put it, contaminated by anyone else. Or if one looks at Johannesburg uh, itself, um, what was known as Malay Camp, um, Sophia Town, and, and areas like that, where people lived in a mixed community, broken down. Mixed communities were then transformed into these racial enclaves. So land was taken, stolen, to build, um, uh, to, to move people away into racial categories. And, and I think one of the things that we need to look at is how much of that land also belonged to people who were not only African. I, I, uh, I'm dealing with a matter in the Northern Cape right now, where people were removed of their land, uh, and they are not African, and, and there is an argument that they have no claim to the land. And I think that, you know, some of these race, racial ide ideas that 
uh, we have must be removed so that we become a bit more real. And so, yes, the principle of our, of our evolution is humaneness. Uh, I agree with that. And I wanted to, to say that by people seeking identity does not mean we must be, be willy-nilly in our approach to developing non-racialism. Acknowledging lived experience is vitally important. It's vitally important to recognize that the most deprived people in South Africa were in, in fact um, the African majority. But that doesn't mean other black people were not deprived. And also as Comrade Solly points out, uh, it doesn't mean that there were segments of the white working class that were also not deprived. And so if we're going to work only on the basis of race and not look at class, we're making a very, very big mistake. Um, and, and for me, uh, the nervousness I have is that um, chauvinism in any form that it takes begins to look at things very narrowly. Comrade Soli calls it a narrow nationalism of all types, but it's also narrow, um, a narrow perspective on class. It does not under, we are not discussing who the, who the working class is. What is the content of today's working class in this country? That will give us an answer to how to tackle the Western Cape issue, where the majority of the people happen to be mixed race and working class or unemployed. That is a fact. We, we consistently try to deny that fact, but it is a fact. It's a reality. And because we deny it, we're also in denial about how people from that particular class wish to be represented and by whom. And they are racist, I have to tell you that. I mean, <laughs> the racism in the Western Cape is appalling. Um, it is, it is deep-rooted, it is, it is uh, hala and ons uh, racism, and uh, it is basically a racism based on fear of losing the little bit of patronage that is still left over there from the apartheid era, and it's nothing. I can tell you that from hard experience that uh, the notion that apartheid was good for the mixed race people is nonsense. Um, uh, my own heritage is Makassar. My, my mother and her people come and they were slaves. They were not grandiose people. They were stolen from Java and they were taken and dropped in Makassar and they starved to death. I have to tell you, the first generation of our family who came died of hunger. Basically, they just starved to death in the slave camps of Makassar, forgotten, you know. Um, so I, I would say let's be a little bit cautious of not looking at everyone's lived experience and how they relate to the current South Africa. Comrade, I, uh, yes, I had great admiration for Josina Michelle, um, but we also have great women from our own country who have you know, I think of Frances Bart, for example. I um, lived with her for a bit in uh, Amanskral, where she was um, banished to. Now, here was a working class leader of trade unions, ca uh, food and ca ca uh, food canning, the canning industry. That's where Mum Frances started with. But let me just say, her, her view was, that if you want to tackle a, a matter, you have, to be you have to be substantially organized and methodical in getting to the point you want to be at. And therefore you have to have cohesion in your message and in your campaign tactic. And her uh, and Ray um, Simon who taught both Jenny and I how to write recipes, which were secret messages. And I think today would have been called a goulash. Uh, Jenny, if I'm not mistaken, the goulash, yeah. I'm not sure which goulash, but it would have not been a fish goulash. A fish goulash was if only white comrades met. Uh, a, a goulash with everything in was all of us meeting. Uh, yeah, A curry goulash was if we met in Durban. So I just want to say that they had many things in common. One of the things in common was stand your ground, manage what you're going to do, find the end. You must know what the end goal is before you get there. Because if you don't understand where you're going to and what you want, your road there is going to be causing a lot of disunity. 
as you bring in many ideas and many people. I did say forced removals didn't just affect one uh, class in this country or one group of people, it affected quite a lot of people. And unfortunately, there's a new kind of forced removal taking place now. Land grabbing by the EFF as a deliberate campaign uh, to destabilize communities. We're not looking at that because we're not willing to tackle this counter-revolutionary force. We're not willing to say to them, you're, you're creating a problem for all of us uh, by, by doing what you're doing. Um, it, 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 and, and I think we need to speak up about, about that a little bit. Uh, comrade, uh, the other matter that um, uh, I like the idea of using heritage man to red card racism and all the comrades that were mentioned by comrade Solly and others are the comrades that we should um, make sure that people understand who they were and what they contributed uh, to our struggle. And even the quieter ones that were never um, talked about, you know, there are many forgotten comrades uh, who are who are the ones in the backroom people. And and I noticed that Comrade Nkarimeng, um, not Nkari, uh, Comrade Nlangeni's book talks about the backroom people. Um, many like that. The people who actually were in the forefront of collecting the clauses of the Freedom Charter. If we had it our way, we need to go back to the Freedom Charter as a campaign tool. Comrade Jeremy, I don't remember if you remember this before you left the country, but what took us into every community, irrespective of race, was that freedom, that first Freedom Charter that we printed in the early 80s. The first copy of that Freedom Charter is what took us into homes and we were not turned back. People understood looked at this and they were excited. And that's how many activists grew out of that campaign of knowing the Freedom Charter and getting people to read it, understand it, and they joined us because of the Freedom Charter, because it had minimum prospects for what everybody could agree to. Um, some of it was controversial, I might add, because some of us wanted to deal with the nationalization issue right there and then and uh, the more sober thinking people at the time said don't uh, don't take it too far you're going to alienate people but people came so i think that's a very good thing to do let's go back to this freedom charter and see how much we can do to bring as many people back together a lot of people just dis uh, dismiss the freedom charter as a liberal uh, a liberal document maybe it is but it did give us the tool that we needed. And we don't have a tool right now, a unifying tool. That is the unifying tool we have. So let me uh, say that I found this very exciting. Um, cans, I like the scans idea. And why we're not there is comrades, ANC party and COSATU comrades have not adopted volunteerism. I'm sorry, that's a fact. We have not got this concept of volunteerism for which we're not going to be paid a daily stipend or a something to go and do this work where you have community action networks. And if we're not there, if we are not leading these cans, then we will be seeing a drift away from the core values of the movement collectively. Thank you very much, comrades. Wonderful. Thank you, Comrade Jesse. Thank you so much. Comrade Soli. Yeah, thank you very much, Comrade Jesse. I think um, Comrade Jesse has, uh, was quite uh, extensive in responding to many questions which I share, uh, many common perspectives there. Uh, I, I fully agree with her, particularly to emphasize her last part around the case that uh, Comrade Jeremy was reminding us. And they've been doing a, a whole lot of uh, good work across the country, even in areas where, for instance, they were not necessarily recognized as such, but there's been quite good work during uh, the lockdowns uh, in different communities. In fact, Comrade Jesse will remember, we, we had a debate in the Secretariat about this thing, because we were looking at how, for instance, the movement was literally confined 
and locked down in houses, except the people in government who had the freedom to distribute food, uh, to go to different areas. And the political entity uh, that is, 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 is leading government was then confined in houses. And we had to come and, and, and tackle that. It was quite not easy, including the trade unions, for instance. We had to try to struggle even for worker representatives to be able to visit the workplace because the, the initial regulations were almost so stringent that unless you were directly going to work at that particular point in time, you were not able to, and those work uh, that is classified, you were not able to have a movement. So I think it's critical that those cans must be uh, enhanced in our communities. In fact, they are within the framework of uh, our community outreach, the building of fronts, uh, in different uh, uh, areas, because what it means is that every other social problem that arises, our activists must have the capacity to bring people together to tackle such, a, such, such an issue on the ground. Um, and sometimes I think uh, we are still uh, uh, too much attached to our organizational form, and therefore adaptability has been difficult. So we need to bring that dynamism for uh, adaptability uh, to existing conditions uh, to respond to, to, to the crisis. I also take the point that Comrade Jeremy is raising about the fact that um, in raising our issues, we shouldn't uh, forget about the national grievance. Of course not, not at all. Um, uh, that issue continues to, to arise. The bottom line is that the leadership of society, if we assert ourselves that role as a liberation movement, we are neglecting that task or in addressing that task of the national grievance, we have unwittingly forgotten all other imperatives that addresses the national grievance itself. That is the response to the national question should not bring about or reverse other fundamental principles, whether it's the principle of non-racism and non-sexism equally. Hence, for instance, uh, as a movement tackling this question, you still have a deepening patriarchy because we're not addressing this question uh, uh, quite clearly. We've alleviated tactical questions into strategic questions. For instance, if uh, we think uh, 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 working with traditional leaders accord us to stay in political power, in, instead of tackling the, the patriarchal question, it's not necessarily to say that, uh, I mean, that there's a huge transformation uh, in traditional organizations today, uh, affirmed even by our own democracy. So the, 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 they are not the absolute uh, 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 entities of patriarch, but that's where, for instance, many of these attitudes are still sustained, either as customs, uh, uh, many other things and so forth, so that we need to, to tackle, so that we are able to treat pe people equally across the board, including uh, on, on, a, on a gender basis. So we're not forgetting that, but I'm, I'm glad that you have uh, highlighted that um, in one of your uh, paradoxes as you are, you are raising them, uh, Comrade JC. I think it's important to say, yes, I want to accept uh, one part of uh, what Comrade Pem was raising regarding uh, experiences in Cuba, which basically embraces the movement in power using political education and ideology as a continuous process of training of society, not as a, a, a special thing if you are in the political organization. Uh, you know, one day uh, my son came back home and, and, and I'm glad now he, he's, he's quite better on this. Um, the teacher had called, I had to go to the school. They, they said that um, uh, Mandela was a criminal. He was very angry. He came home and said, how is it possible that Mandela was a criminal? Because the teacher said so at school. I had to go to the school to address this particular matter because they simply said all those who are in jail are criminals. They come from jail. And one, one chap in the class said, even uh, Mandela, they said yes. So it is that because it's not embedded in our so society as a whole, including in the education uh, value system that we're we 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 building. And therefore, it's critical that the history of the liberation struggle and the, the history of the future of our society, if uh, 
were, were, were to make this parallel in terms of the aspirations of the future of our society should constitute the core of the aspiration of the classroom. So that the classrooms are not only taught about wrong things, but the correct things that were, were the things that were correcting uh, found themselves in, in the expression uh, uh, in, in the classrooms, including uh, the role of the public broadcaster, for instance, and the, the broader arts community, uh, including the media, on propagating liberation ideas. And therefore, that becomes important. And I think Comrade Rika and, um, and others who had uh, interfaced quite clearly with progressive ideas, even from the newspapers, the party's uh, New Age newspaper itself, uh, not this one of the Guptas, the SACP's New Age, uh, the original New Age newspaper in South Africa, propagated progressive ideas. And therefore, that's very important that we still need to not to live away from that. We, 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 we need to rebuild capacity even in that particular space. I think the last thing maybe to respond to is this question of um, Comrade Pam raises. And I think um, uh, the way she raised this uh, creates tensions. Safe to say, and I think Comrade Jeremy tried to respond to it. Um, crime in South Africa, it's a, it's, it's a big problem across the board. Um, it affects uh, all classes and so on. When we talk about the crisis of social reproduction, we're talking about a situation where the, how the people make ends meet becomes too difficult because of both the political and the economic system that produces the social system that we have. So the crisis of the capitalist system inv invariably creates a crisis in the economic system, in the social system. That is why we have to tackle this matter proper and the affirmation of a public sector based economy and public sector driven economy becomes important so that we are able to address all these problems of poverty because a poor person who has nothing to eat, and this is not to, to justify uh, the end goal of that, if, for instance, they end up committing crime. Others do very degrading work uh, uh, in order to, to make ends meet. And the fact that South Africa's own economic development has been at the cost of other regional economies, whether it's uh, the economy of SADC, for instance, that have uh, largely depended on South Africa's uh, own growth. In fact, if you were to look into the origin of the SACO uh, program, South African Customs Union program, Southern African Customs Union program, you'll find that at the core of that was that because of South Africa's bullishness and dominance in the region, it denied even industrial development in the region. And it, it took responsibility for industrial development and also for acquisition of labor from the region, of course, cheap labor into the South African industry uh, at a cost of a particular payment. Now, this country therefore became the most developed and therefore the magnet of the continent, not only of the region, where people can go and get employment and they will continue to come. So we can't fight against them. What we need to look into is the source of the problem and tackle crime and criminality comprehensively whether it's committed by South Africans, whether it's committed by non-South Africans. But at the same time, we as a country, I mean, we have, we have seen how uh, we've never looked even after uh, the basic things like uh, borders and everything else. Not that uh, at the moment, perhaps because of uh, the concept of uh, nation states, they may become so, so critical, but our borders are so porous uh, people walk in, I saw people in East London uh, 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 coming from a, a, a boat midnight. So they are so open. So we need to deal with this, but also in the other areas as well. But also remembering that in South Africa today, and I think that's part of our nationalism, uh, when we, we resolve the national question in South Africa, it's not just resolving the, the, the racial question. It's also to resolve the construct of the development of the homeland system. As we speak, there are more Swazis in South Africa than in Swaziland. South, South African Swazis 
There are more South African Basotho than Basotho in Lesotho. There are more South African Botswana than Botswana in Botswana, because these were one people. So it's, it's important that when we deal with this particular question, we, 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 we broaden our scope. And, and, and of course, making sure that even our education system responds to the appropriate technical training of South Africa's youth so that the youth and, and many other people can create employment than simply think that they can go to institutions of learning, uh, take TV at colleges, universities, and come back and look for a job. You should actually be trained to create a job. As you leave the institutions, you are looking at how to create jobs. You become job creators in your own. So it is that kind of a thing that I think it's, it's, uh, it's, it's important, but also how we can mix cooperative economy in that ability to create jobs of individuals and young people, particularly in, a, in, in our country. We can harness the resources of the Republic, as well as in, if, if we harness that, we won't have problems of uh, 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 people from the neighboring countries, for instance, arriving here and even from other uh, African countries arriving here to seek for, 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 a, for a job. But understanding that the part of the limitations today is the concept of the uh, uh, nation state as constructed. So we have to respond effectively to that as a, as, a, as a country. But I think as a movement, we have to pay homage to all those who contributed immensely to the successes that we, are, we have today, black and white, um, and, and remember them proper. Uh, for instance, uh, 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 you know, even when we launched our arm, arm struggle, one remind, is reminded I, I saw one comrade from uh, uh, Basel February district of the Communist Party. It is Basel February who was the first uh, uh, combatant to fall after the official launch of our, of, of our struggle through the one Kings Polito operations, for instance. So it's, all these things are not in the general lexicon of our society. And if we were to, 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 to think about that, how many times have we spoken about Basel February, for instance? We, we, we think that young people were only represented by Solomon Masangu, important as he was, because he became a particular symbol elevated by our movement, and particularly his sharpness, what he said in court. So it is that that is critical. But he represented a generation of young people amongst our, our, our people who are fighting for liberation across racial lines. Some who are still alive, white people, I mean, who can forget the, the, the young Henry Kroskop, for instance, who was so highly hated by the apartheid regime because of his exploits and many others. Like if we were to look at those who are, who are Comrade Jesse knows this thing, we always have a, a, myself and a debate about this. One of our own comrades, uh, McBride. It's one of my favorite uh, uh, comrades, that one. Brilliant young comrade who took up arm struggle you know, if you read his own exploits in this space, you can see the commitment was unmatched. But sometimes, how do we treat him? We treat him like how George Merrin treated him. And many others, the, 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 those white racists who were defending the apartheid system. So it is critical that as we, we, we have to tackle racism broadly without flinching as a movement and construct indeed a new and racial society uh, uh, based on respect for human rights uh, and respect for access to resources for all uh, in our country. And this country has got enough that it can feed its people as well as the, the people that may, may, may require uh, to interface with it for their own livelihoods. But otherwise, uh, thank you very much, uh, Comrade JC, for your facilitation um, of this particular session. And other comrades who have joined in and make, made contributions there have been many good contributions in, in, in the space there. Perhaps uh, we need to resuscitate that uh, program. Uh, I remember that uh, Comrade uh, Jesse, when she's talking about this uh, uh, Freedom Charter uh, uh, pamphlets, uh, at the time they were regarded as staff. They were difficult to get because they were circulated underground. Some were fainted. Comrade Oros, uh, she knows him very well, was one of my, 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 my leaders underground. He used to, to make us read that and memorize the, 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 the clause without fail so that we never forget this thing. And if we get that type right, we can actually retype the freedom charter itself. So that's, it's a unifying uh, concept. 
as well as a program for our country. And I think it's a radical program on its own if properly implemented uh, the Freedom Charter. We, might, we can use it to remobilize our, our society and actually take into consideration the achievements that we've made from within the Freedom Charter and continue to develop our, 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 our society as common people, one people. Thank you very much, Comrade Jason. Okay, thanks very, very much, Comrade Sonny. So, comments for me that the that, that take home from this is that um, one, we've got a battle on our hands, um, which is not a new battle, but it has resurfaced uh, in the current reality of our movement uh, and of the situation and of the progress that we've made as well. Uh, and that is that the struggle against uh, racism in its various forms, xenophobia in its various forms, a, a related issue, um, all of those are, are ongoing struggles. And I think that what, what has come through quite strongly um, is, is how, do we, how do we take on the, this battle? And I think it's, it's in at least two different ways. The one is an ideological battle, an ideological struggle, one of, of remembering the, the, you know, the struggle is also the struggle against forgetting, as, as Comrade Rusty Bernstein said, um, remembering Rika Hodgson, remembering the Freedom Charter, remembering Basil February, remembering the, the amazing non-racial and many other features of the tradition of which we are all products. So it's about remembering, it's about visiting museums, as Comrade Pat, uh, Pam said, um, so, that, so that we keep history alive and the positive lessons of that history alive. But at the same time, I don't think, and I think that's what uh, the colleagues who are on the panel were, were saying, is that we don't fight um, racism and, and for a, a non-racial tradition simply at the ideological level narrowly. What are the campaigns on the ground? How do we, you know, Wolfie Kodish educated Madiba, not by telling Madiba about non-racialism or about, but through practical activity, working with him. Um, and that's how most of us have acquired our non-racialism is, is not at, in the realm of ideas, but through practi practical activity around issues which are of importance. So for instance, how do we as a movement make sure that our government really now seriously implements a national health insurance or a basic income grant, both of which are based on non-racial solidarity, human solidarity, both of those things. So how do, we, how do we gear our movement up, not to focus on who gets to be elected into this or that structure, but how do we mobilize actively and build non-racialism in those ways, not just through lecturing around it, which is important, or remembering a Basil February or a Rika Hotch, as critical as that is, but also through working together on the ground around issues which unite us uh, on the basis of human solidarity. So thank you very much to Comrade Spencer. It was a wonderful video clip and wonderful to rec recall your, your wonderful mom uh, and wonderful family. Um, to Comrade Jesse, thank you for your critical remarks and for uh, shaking, stirring the pot. Um, I'm not sure if it was goulash and what kind of goulash, but you stirred it. And it's very important to keep doing it. And Comrade Solly, thanks as always for your, your passion and fearlessness in taking head on uh, difficult issues. Uh, and then thanks to all the participants and particularly to the host, uh, Comrade uh, Jenny Schreiner. Uh, I think that we've had a, a successful uh, but ongoing discussion that is so critical for our revolution. Amandla. Away, two. Away, two. Away, two. Amandla. Amandla. Away, two. Away, two. Come on, I'm a pussy guys. Come on, I'm a pussy guys. Away, two. Well done.